Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the service. And also, I just bring a couple of things to your attention, though they're written in your um, update. With regard to the services for Easter, please will you um, take special note of the times. Uh, on Palm Sunday, there will be a service, there will be services at 9 a.m. and at 10.15. At, that's today, of course. On Maundy Thursday, 1st of April, there is a service at 7.30 p.m. On Good Friday, the time will be at 10 a.m. And on Easter Day, the service will be at 10.15. There will be no um, ecumenical witness walk this year because of previous, um, previous notices about uh, COVID and the restrictions for that. But we hope you will be able to join in all the services or at least some of them. Uh, around Easter. And I'd like to um, make special note today of the pleasure of Roy and his special day that will come later in the service. Thank you. Good morning. This is a special Sunday, of course. It's the beginning of Holy Week, and it's the Sunday in which we celebrate the celebration of the palms. And that is the recognition, the story of we find in the Gospels of the palm trees or the branches, as mentioned in other parts of the scriptures, laid before the feet of Jesus as he comes into Jerusalem. And it has traditionally been, over the last few years, a celebration of peace, of the coming of peace into our world. After the service this afternoon, I think at 2 or 2.30, there will be a peace march, which has been going for 30 years plus uh, in the city. And of course, all are invited to be a part of that. There's a, there's a banner with the Uniting Church on it that you can march under or you can walk by yourself, however you choose to be a part of that particular celebration that, uh, as I said, has happened for so many years. As a sign of our commitment uh, to peace in our world, I'm going to invite Christine to come forward as we light these uh, small candles as a recognition of peace. Thank you, Christine.
And as we reflected on our time of peace, let us use the gathering words to lead us into worship. As Jesus rides into Jerusalem, he comes as the one who brings peace, hope, love, joy and new life. Among the poor, among the proud, among the persecuted and among the privileged. Christ is bringing peace and new life. In the private house and in the public place, in the wedding feast and in the judgment hall. Christ is bringing hope and new life. With a gentle touch, with an angry word, with a clear conscience and with a strong commitment, Christ is bringing love and new life. That the new order may come, that the world might believe, that the powerful might stumble and that the hidden might be seen. Christ is bringing love and new life. Within us, around us, behind us, before us, in this place and in every place, at this time and for all time. Christ is making all things new. Let us sing together our first hymn. <laughs> Well, we have a wonderful opportunity this morning to welcome Ray Watson into membership. And I'm going to invite Ray, if you'd come forward, to be part of our gathering here. And you can use that uh, side there if you like, Ray. No, you'll have to, have to come up here. Because of our live stream, everything has to be done from here. But if you want to take the, uh, the walk there.
You'd be disappointed if I didn't have a story, wouldn't you? Um, when I was in theological college, one of our students had to receive into membership for the first time in his life uh, a man who had joined his church. And so the man came down to the front of the service and Don stood in front of him and said, G'day. <laughs> We're not going to do that today. Um, this, is, this is 12 years in the making, uh, 12 months in the making. This time last year, we were about to receive Ray into membership and then COVID struck. And so we've had to wait for this. But let me just tell you a few things about uh, Ray that I've learnt. We've become quite good friends. He comes from Queensland originally. He trained as an engineer. He comes to us from the Australian Capital Territory. And I was reminded of two things as I thought about this morning. One was a sermon that Christopher preached last year and he tells me it wasn't original and that's unusual, but it was the sermon in which he said, what is the order of things? Is it believe, behave, belong, or is it belong, behave, believe? And Ray comes to us today as someone who belongs. Some years ago, I heard a, a Presbyterian minister say, and it was in good company because he got it from a Jesuit priest. He said, you can sum up the gospel in four words. You matter and you belong. And so this morning, Ray, we're affirming positively that you belong. I think one of the most exciting things in my ministry of 100 years was the wonderful service that I shared with Ray. His grandson, Alexander, was baptised in the, uh, the Catholic Church in Armidale and Father Brendan and I conducted that service together. It was the first time that Father Brendan had done a baptismal service with someone else and it was such an honour to be at that at ceremony where we welcomed Alexander into the church. Thank you for being with us, Ray, and I'll hand over to Christopher. Come over here, Ray. Yes. Ray, you are most welcome in this particular community. Thank you. You're already a part of this community. I often feel it's a bit strange when we welcome people in after they've been here for some time, but you are a part of our gathering here at, at Turak Uniting Church, and we're very pleased with that opportunity. And as John has already mentioned, uh, you've had a number of experiences associated with the church here, including the baptism of your grandson, and we're very pleased that that could be a part of your time with us today. So on behalf of Turak Uniting Church, I would welcome you into full membership in this congregation. Thank you very much. Let us bow together in prayer. We give you thanks, loving God. The community can name us, can form us, can bring us together in so many different ways. I pray for Ray, for the opportunities that he has already had to connect with those who are here at Turak, but also for the new opportunities that will be a part of his time together with us. We give you thanks for the ministry that he brings, for the ministry that he will receive from this community. And so bless Ray, bless us as a gathering together. May we be responsible in how we deal and treat Ray at this time and may he have the opportunities to be able to share himself and his life experience with us. For this, we give you thanks. Amen. 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 Thanks, Ray. Thank you. All the best. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, James is going to bring us our reading, but be, just as he's coming up here, if you are interested in membership, come to speak to myself or to John and we will certainly uh, put you on the right track. 
Thanks, thanks, James. Sorry, Matt. I'm just kidding. The first reading is from Psalm 118, verses 1 to 2, and then verses 19 to 29. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, God's steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever.
The second reading is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden, Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the ground. Others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. These words can bring us new life. Thanks, Peter. Let us pray. We're grateful, loving God, for your presence with us today, particularly on this Sunday. This Sunday of the celebration of palms, of a recognition that it's Jesus who came from Capernaum, who gathered his disciples from around Palestine, comes into this centre of religiosity, the place of Jerusalem where he will be crucified. May we move toward that with a sense of solemnity, but also with a recognition that new life will emerge from this time of reflection and death. For this we give you thanks. Amen.
Now, you must be getting a bit tired of me mentioning my trip to uh, Jerusalem, which happened about, uh, I suppose, about 11 or 12 years ago. But I mention it so often because it was so significant. Um, I'd been a minister for many years and I hadn't been to Jerusalem before. And so I had the chance not only to visit Jerusalem, but also to to be in uh, Israel and to spend time in Capernaum and other places as such. Jerusalem is a remarkable place today as it was in the time of Jesus. I may have mentioned once before that there's a psychological condition associated with some people who visit Jerusalem. It's called the Jerusalem Syndrome. It can affect people psychologically who are normally psychologically healthy when they visit this central religious place. Jerusalem is overlaid historically, theologically, ideologically, religiously with so many different layers. It seems to be related, this syndrome, to the encounter with a place that has an overabundance of religious significance. And it's quite interesting that this syndrome, this psychological feeling that people have, is not related just to Christianity, but also to those who are Jewish who visit, who are Muslim who visit, and who are Christians who visit. Why does it happen? Psychologists have looked at it for years and haven't really been able to work out other than it is an overcoming of something deep within that has been so much woven into the very life of all of us. I suspect that certainly within this community, just the word Jerusalem will already conjure up ideas and thoughts within your own mind of a place. They may be accurate, they may not be, they may be biblical, they may be 20th, 20th century. There'll be many aspects to it. Of course, it's a city that existed 200 years before the birth of Jesus, associated most with King David, who was the one who actually brought Jerusalem into the role of being a city, who actually conquered the Jebusites, the uh, poor people who were already there and were a part of the country. But it became for those who were the followers of Moses, of Abraham, of, of all of those saints, became the, pers the, the place where they discovered they had a home and they belonged. That itself, of course, we know has caused problems throughout the generations in terms of life itself. But it can be a place that can overwhelm you. Now, as I said, I, I spent um, quite a few weeks in Jerusalem and then quite a few weeks in, uh, in Capernaum and in the northern part around Galilee, where Jesus spent most of his ministry. Can I say it again? Jesus was not a, a city boy. He was from the country and his ministry was done mostly within the country. And it's now that we need to find Jesus in this central religious place of Jerusalem, where he will be tried, he will be executed, and he will, his followers will experience this sense of new life, that he is not necessarily gone, but still present with us. I suppose that obsession with Jerusalem is something to do with the stories, with the myths, with the mysteries, with the messiahs, with the symbols, all associated with this place that can overwhelm each one of us. When was the first time you heard about Jerusalem? Maybe you were three, four, five years of age, perhaps a teenager, whatever it was, it was probably quite a long time ago. 
because we've all had that part of that city ground into our being, into who we are as human beings and particularly as religious people, as followers of Jesus. As I said, we often associate Jesus with Jerusalem, but he's really associated, of course, with Galilee, with that whole area there, and Jerusalem now becomes the central focus just for a very short time in which we will find the life of Jesus being taken from him. By whom? By the religious authorities, by the political authorities as such. The interesting thing about visiting Jerusalem today is that there isn't a lot of difference between what it looks like, the old city that is. Of course, Jerusalem is much bigger than just the old city. The old city is around about a kilometre by a kilometre, so it's relatively small, completely walled all the way around. The walls do not go back to Jesus' time. They have been pulled down, rebuilt, pulled down, rebuilt, pulled down, rebuilt, which is what happens with any city in that way. But they still remain with the very essence of what it is to be in a sacred place. I had the opportunity to actually see what we would call Golgotha. Now, it may not be as one would imagine. If you have a religious site, what's the first thing you do with it? Anybody have an idea what you do with the religious site? Have a guess. You build a church on it. That's the first thing you do, is you build a church on a religious site. So it's quite interesting that Golgotha, Calvary, the place of Jesus' death, which archaeologists have a pretty good idea of where it is, from working out from the site where the walls were and so forth. It's in the basement of a church. Just a bit of a mound of dirt in the basement of a church. A garbage dump, which is what it was. We know that. Most of the garbage has been taken away now, probably as souvenirs uh, to be displayed in some other place. But it was in the very basement of a church and down we went, down we went into this place and stood there and just reflected upon it for some time. At one level, it, it, it doesn't matter where Jesus was crucified, but there is something symbolic about being in a place where you know something so significant has actually happened 2,000 years earlier. And there we stood and, and looked at this particular place and I think the priest who was leading us offered a prayer. But what I wanted to really say was that the city itself hasn't changed a lot. Probably the stuff they sell might be a bit different today. It's all made in... Asia or somewhere rather than uh, in the Middle East, but it's pretty well the same thing. It's a trader's place. Now, not only is it a trader's place where you buy and sell, which we might think is a bit tacky when we're walking down because we're expecting something holier than that. Nevertheless, it is and has always been a crossroad not just a crossroad for trade, which it was, but a crossroad for ideas, for religious ideas and so forth. And so Israel and Jerusalem particularly, of course, has been a place where people have, have come together talk, speaking different languages uh, and trading with one another and trading ideas with one another. So it became a very significant place. The other interesting thing about it is that we have an idea of what a procession should look like. Well, I know what a procession should look like. It should look like what's going to happen this afternoon in Swanston Street. It should be a few thousand people 
marching down the centre of a large street, carrying whatever it is, banners or notes or, or whatever, and fighting their way down and then having speeches at the end of the, of the uh, gathering. But if you walk through the streets of Jerusalem, you can reach out on one hand and touch one wall, and you can reach out on the other hand and touch the other wall. That's what ancient cities were. And if you're lucky, someone won't throw a bucket of something on your head because that's also what ancient cities were. So when you imagine, just for a moment, this procession, procession of palms, of, of, of coats being thrown, as, as uh, Matthew's Gospel mentions, um, of people pulling branches off the trees. It, does, it doesn't in each of the Gospels say they were palms. It's just assumed that they were palms because they were in that part of the world. They were pulling branches on. But it was a common thing to place red carpet. Uh, we didn't have any red carpet, so what do you do? Take off your garment or put down branches so that it would give the idea that this person who is coming is is an important person and a significant person. But it was all happening within a very closed environment and a very small environment. A procession, yes, it was. But it was of a person who was coming into a city on a donkey, not on a war horse, and coming with a group of disciples, and there would have been more of a quizzical nature about what was happening. What's the noise happening up the street? Oh, I don't know. Something's going on up there. Oh, oh, I heard that there's someone coming to town who's supposed to be fairly famous or whatever. Oh, really? Not the same person as last week. He was a bit of a disaster. And it would have been that kind of conversation that would have happened within the environment. Because remember, Jesus is coming into this environment as the hidden one. He's coming bringing something that is not a part of the culture of that time. Jerusalem is under the power of the Romans and the Romans know how to do processions. They know how to make something seem particularly important. But not this. This was unimportant in one sense. And yet perhaps the most important thing that had ever happened before in the world we read before from the, from the Gospel the story about David, King David. And I mentioned that King David was really the founder of Jerusalem, the one who brought Jerusalem into the realm of being a city and a significant city too. And of course, his legacy went on and on through Solomon and many of the others, other leaders of the time, even to the point where Matthew wants to link Jesus with David because he was such a significant person within the culture at that time and probably continues even uh, till today. I mentioned to the nine o'clock if you go to stay in Jerusalem and you want to stay at the best hotel, which one do you stay at? Who knows? King David Hotel best hotel in Jerusalem. That's where you stay. That's where all of the dignitaries from around the world stay. It remains a significant and fundamental part of the very nature of what it means to be Jewish around that idea. But I want us to look, just as we spend just the last few minutes on this, and that is to look at this story in three different ways. Now, this might be difficult because I was trying to write it out and I found it very difficult. First of all, there's a sense in which this story has a past. And that is the reference to it is the reference to King David. It's the reference to David being the, the one who will bring freedom to 
Jerusalem. By the time the Psalms were written, Jerusalem was really a vassal. That is, it was under the control of the Romans. And that this king, or at least the representative of this king, David, would be the one who would bring peace. How do you bring peace to a city? You bring it through violence. You bring it through war. And there were, at this time, of course, the zealots who were there and wanted to make sure that they showed the Romans who was boss and that the boss was the king of Israel. And so the story itself reflects upon the notion that a person in the same image as David is going to take control and is going to bring back Jerusalem into its rightful place. And that's the first aspect, and that comes through from the Psalms, when we read, when we read the Psalms. And so, Hosanna, Hosanna, he comes in the name of the Lord. But then there's another aspect to the story, because he doesn't come as a conquering hero, or does he? Well, he certainly doesn't come as a hero who has troops and is violent. If the Romans were going to do this, they'd have, I don't know, three or four hundred troops marching forward in front of the commander-in-chief and a few hundred behind. I don't, know, I don't know enough about my Roman history to know how they would do it, but they would do it with pomp and ceremony. Here we've got another kind of pomp and ceremony, and that is that Jesus comes on a donkey. Now, donkeys weren't quite as devalued as they are today. They were still something that you would use within a procession. And so we don't need to see the fact that Jesus came on a donkey as, as necessarily um, a weak thing. But he would have come as a small group of people who would have wanted to see something happen. Some would have thought, well, I don't know how this is going to happen, but there is going to be some kind of revolution and there will be a change of government. And one party will be out and another one was in. Well, you didn't really have parties back in that day. You had empires. So one empire will be out and another empire will be in. And that was the desire, obviously, from a very large group of people. Do you really want to live under a foreign emperor all the time? Of course not. People want a sense of freedom to be able to do what they want to do. And yet... Here comes a message that they had not heard before. And that is there is going to be a transformation. There's going to be a change. Things are going to be different. And that is there is going to be a revolution. But it's going to be a revolution of the heart. And that is Jesus is going to bring a new ideology a new message, a new way of being in the world. And that way is going to be completely reversed. It's actually going to be from the inside out rather than from the outside in. Most often we change each other from the outside in. I'm going to make you do this and you'll do it. Well, that doesn't quite work at Turak Uniting Church, but anyway, in politics it does. I'm going to make you do it, and you will change, and you will do it. This other notion, which is almost impossible to believe and to understand, is that there is an internal transformation that it will happen from the inside out. It will be based upon, as we know, and it's mentioned over and over in the Gospels, it's based upon love. Now, 
We must be careful that we don't sentimentalise this. Because remember, in 2,000 years, we still look around our world and we see some of the most awful violence and war that we've ever seen. We've seen genocide over and over again. The only way I think that we can understand this is in two particular aspects. First of all, to do with time. We have no control over time. For us, 2,000 years is a long time. But maybe 10,000 years or 100,000 years is something that's going to take for this to take root within the very being of humanity. And that is that love can conquer all. Poets write about it, philosophers write about it, theologians write about it. We wish for it, we pray for it. It doesn't quite seem to happen, but that doesn't mean to say that people of faith can't still recognise that it can happen. That's because we worship the God of the impossible. And the impossible, of course, is that we can have peace within our time. Pray God we can. Or that we can have peace within our world. And that's what keeps our faith alive. Our faith alive is not by looking around and seeing the good things that happen. I have no problem looking around and seeing the good things that are happening. That's an important part of being a healthy human being. But there also needs to be a much deeper level, a much richer level, and that is to look around and see the things that aren't happening. And that's what faith is about. Faith is that belief in the God of the impossible. I can't see how that could happen. It's totally impossible to my imagination. I cannot see how the world could live within a world of love and hope and peace and so forth. Well, now you're in the right place because now you're in the place of God. You're in the place of faith. You live into it. You live into the sense of impossibility of recognising that it is beyond me to be able to make the changes. Do I participate in them? Do I acknowledge them? Of course I do. That's what it means to be, as I mentioned before, a healthy human being, to be willing to hold that these truths will come to be. Do I have the power to bring them about? No, I don't. I can participate, but I cannot necessarily do them. One of the theologians that I particularly like reading often talks about God doesn't so much exist. He's trying to, like all philosophers, play around with words. He said God doesn't exist. That is, God's not an object out there that exists. God doesn't so much exist, God insists. God insists. That is, God comes to us as a presence that keeps working over and over within us. And so, to finish, Jesus rides this donkey into the city. It's a story probably embellished by the various gospel writers not mentioned by Paul as such, but something that gives a sense of hope that the world will change, that the world of the people will change. And it's written, of course, not only for the people of the day, it's written for us today, that we may see that the world can change, that the God of the impossible can do the possible can bring about a whole new way for us to understand and live within the world. March for peace. Work for peace. 
Hope for peace. Live for peace. Be peaceful. Oh, oh I think that was actually meant for me. Uh, but anyway, we'll add it to everybody. Live for peace. And that is then entering into the very nature and the principle of God. And that is, even though it's impossible to see at the moment, and I can't see it, I can't see the world. If I watch television on, on at seven o'clock on, on uh, during the week, now you know that I watch the ABC. I can't see it. And the journalists certainly can't see it because all they want to do is show me more and more pictures of war. Very seldom do I see a picture on my television set that has to do with peace or a new way of thinking. You get it occasionally. But when I live into it, it does something to me. It changes me. It gives me maybe a sense of hope. It helps me with one of the pieces that the choir sang right at the very beginning earlier about going through the valley of darkness and yet still being able to hold life, live life, know that life is of value and worthwhile. So many things that this simple story of Jesus coming into Jerusalem can remind us. Maundy Thursday, we will continue here and gather. Good Friday, we will gather again to remember the death, the crucifixion of Jesus. Easter Sunday, daylight changing time. Don't forget that. We will also come. Why will we come? Not to say that suffering is all over. Not to say that, oh, it's finished, it's all done, life is now beautiful and wonderful. It's not. We know that. What it says is that there is hope and that the God of the impossible is a God who I follow and I'm willing to place my life and energy into that kind of God. Amen. There is a, a, a communion bowl, uh, bowl at the back of the church for those who would like to put an offering. Um, as we've said for the last year, um, please um, make your offering through the church website. Uh, it's a fit, simple process. If you have any difficulty with it, the office can help you or, uh, or one of the um, management team can help you make that con contribution. Uh, let us reflect upon our giving at this time.
Let us pray. We are grateful for the gifts that come into our lives, our God. We pray for the wisdom and the courage to share what we have with those around us. We thank you for the money that is given to this community. May it also be shared among those who are a part of the mission and the ministry of Turak Uniting Church. Loving God, you come into our lives as the one who does bring compassion, as the giver of life. On this Palm Sunday, may we give honour and praise to you and to the one who brings life into our world. But we also recognise the reversal of what it means to be a king, not to sit on a great throne above us, but perhaps to sit on the pavement with us. The procession, our God, is not some great celebration of power, but rather a recognition that even in the smallest gathering of people, those who are committed to peace and to hope and to love will have their day. So establish, we pray, our God, a new order, an order of justice and of peace and of love within our world today. Give us what we need so that we may grow in wholeness and compassion, that we may enlarge our souls through forgiveness of others and the willingness to accept forgiveness when it is shown to us. Strengthen us in the time of testing so that we will resist all evil and have courage to face that which is malice in ourselves and in others. For in our lives, our community, our world, we desire tenderness, strength, love, resilience and wisdom. For yours is the emerging world, now and forever. Amen. Let us sing our final hymn, number 333, All Glory, Praise and Honour.
Each week we gather in this beautiful space to find peace. Each week, words and music offer and celebrate peace. Peace with hope, which may be instilled within us. Now take the peace you have found in this service into your daily life. Renewed in your faith and inspired to act, let us be the peacemakers the world aches for. And by being peacemakers, let us find the peace we long for. Go in peace, make peace, be at peace. Amen.